And I'm back again. I'll be bouncing in and out of the, the screen. Um, wonderful finding out about card storage and batteries, but fortunately I have a second battery for the camera. Cleaned up the card. So, as I was finishing up on the last one, we covered the, pull, the woolly pulley. The sweater that was harried, pullover sweater. Um, in Britain they call it a jumper. We call it a pullover sweater. And there's a variety of uh, styles, some with turtlenecks or high neck. This is a v-neck style. Um, this would have been carried in, this was carried in the pack and was used to, uh, underneath the battle dress to keep warm um, as well as during the day and at night because we know, of course, through our own experience that it gets cold at night. Um, that's the gear that came from in here in the small pack. Would have been in that, this big pocket back here and then on the top with these flaps over to help protect it from rain and weather when that's over. There's two more pockets in the small pack. One's got a mess tin in it. This is the bottom part of a two-part mess tin. This one is a reproduction aluminum one. Uh, aluminum was utilized late in the war. Uh, there are original aluminum and um, uh, tinned uh, original uh, mess tins out. There's a big debate as to whether or not the early war ones are safe to use because of the tinning and lead solder fears. I have a reproduction aluminum late war. They look the same. They work the same. They nest inside meant for heating up the foods uh, that you would get. Inside uh, you were supposed to nest uh, the 24-hour rations. When you didn't have an issued 24-hour salt ration, you would put uh, various foodstuffs that you'd get from the compo rations, uh, which was the um, main field ration that was supposed to be consumed. Uh, you would take them out, put them in to protect them in here. Also utilized to hold personal gear and equipment, uh, shaving mirror, protected so that you could do those field evolutions, the, uh, you know, keep yourself shaved and uh, clean. Uh, this is called a housef, housewife. Uh, practically every army had them. They were designed for keeping your uniform in repair. You might have patch cloths, a darning wool for your socks, uh, thread, needles. Uh, when you were not in combat, there were these guys called sergeants who would make sure that you would field repair your uniform. You'd have to maintain it. Uh, inside the large pack would be the clothing brush to brush off the wool uniform. Um, the hussif was um, supposed to go in there, but a lot of the guys carried it in their small pack so they could do the field repairs because this pack might not reach them um, for several days. So you would sew up any rents, replace buttons, um, you would care for the uniform. You would not sit there and keep it dirty and nasty and ripped up. Any time you had, you would do repairs. Sergeants would make sure you did the repairs. Uh, we also have spare matches. This is a reproduction tin of cigarettes. Um, original tins didn't necessarily look like this. There are some uh, historical flat ones. They would have been a little bit more square, a little smaller. The cigarettes were smaller then. Um, also, they had tin can style, uh, you know, the round can style for the cigarette rations. These were issued. This was common then. We are absolutely deeply concerned about uh, smoking now and its health hazards, but cigarettes were considered an essential uh, comfort item. It also served a couple of dual purposes. Uh, Anyone who um, had fathers or grandfathers in the field, uh, like my father, he smoked during the Vietnam War. Um, the cigarette or, or tobacco smoke um, from his pipe kept insects away. It also served a purpose of hiding the smell of the battlefield. It's not a pleasant area to be in. Um, we could discuss why. I won't. We should be able to figure it out. Extra toilet paper, you stockpile this. If you didn't use it, you kept it. It would serve a purpose. Its purpose. A couple of spare handkerchiefs. 
I have two different emergency rations that I've got in here. One's a private purchase, Horlicks um, emergency uh, tabs. Uh, this little tin is supposed to be a 24-hour ration in and of itself. Uh, high energy, high carbohydrate uh, tablets. You can, these are still manufactured to this day, by the way. Horlicks is still in, 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 com in use. Um, these were uh, meant to keep you going. They wouldn't fill you up, but they give you the energy. And then this is a reproduction of a standard ration that you were not supposed to eat until ordered to. If there were officers around, uh, they, they would be the ones giving you permission. This was supposed to be kept just in case. Uh, this would have, again, a high energy bar, probably some kind of uh, distasteful chocolate. They didn't weren't worried about flavor so much as packing as much energy as possible. There would be a little tea bag, a little sugar bag in here, and matches. This was a, a survival ration. And then one of the other things, these were issue. I don't think I need to explain it. What its main use was for. Uh, they did a couple of other things with it. Uh, they would be used over the muzzle of the rifle to keep water from going in when doing the landings. Um, if you look very carefully at some of the original footage, you can see it in its use. Its main use was still vital though. VD was an issue. Disease incapacitated and um, made non-serviceable more men than battle wounds. Uh, disease was an extreme issue by all armies. Every single army except one issued condoms to the troops. The next item on D-Day, uh, the Normandy invasions, British troops were issued two 24-hour rations each. The idea was that after uh, 48 hours, uh, the ships would have unloaded field kitchens and what they, the British called the compo ration, the composition rations, which would be a two-can ration of uh, biscuits, crackers, um, and the sides, and one can of some kind of meat. The troops were given these. These were supposed to sustain them for that first 48 hours until the rest of the supplies could follow up. Um, this single box, uh, this particular box is, there's a debate as to whether, how accurate this box is. This box appears to have been, um, this is a reproduction, uh, a Canadian style box. Um, uh, there is, of course, British troops uh, from England would have these as well because those supplies would have been shipped in from Canada for the General Army's use. Uh, this box was supposed to have enough in it to keep you going for 24 hours. The um, by the regulation boxes that we have that uh, we see uh, appearing now is this particular style of box. Um, it was it's called a shoulder box because of its construct. This is one of the existing uh, surviving instructions show this particular style of box being done. Both seem to have been accurate. Just one more earlier war or from Canada and the other the later war style. This particular style had tinned rations. By the um, end of the war, these type of rations really aren't being seen as 24-hour rations. Uh, they're rel relatively heavy because of the tins of food product that were in them. This one is a little bit later, so less tin in it. Um, it's starting the generational change and modifications to make it easier for troops to carry in the field, lighten the load so they can move farther, faster, not get bogged down. It has a menu ration with suggestions on how its product the contents were to be uh, consumed. You have an oatmeal pack, biscuits, we call them crackers or cookies, the British call them biscuits, and you have two types, sweet and plain. You have a three-in-one tea ration. Uh, these particular rations are called three-in-ones because it's really ground up tea leaves, sugar, and powdered milk. So everything in one so that you yeah, boil up this in water and you have your tea. Boiled sweets, hard candies, all about the sugar. All about those calories. You've got a comfort item gum, matches, the toilet paper ration, eh. 
Sorry about that. Soup. There's two of them there. Uh, bouillon cubes. Compressed. Really compressed. Bouillon. That's what it is. To make a what we would call a thin soup or a clear soup. That's what that was designed for. More sugar. God, there's a lot of sugar. Then a vitamin enriched chocolate bar. This was to make sure that they got all the nutrients that they needed to keep going. And here's the tin. Dripping spread. This is going to be a high fat meat ground product that could be smeared easily on the crackers for use if not just eaten out of the tin with the spoon. And that's was, like I said, two of these would be issued. There would be a couple of different menus going on in these, uh, depending on um, what blind box you got. You'd have spam, ham, chicken, turkey, the dip, dripping spread. The menu, the items changed throughout the war as they came up with more efficient, better items uh, to put in these rations as they were trying to work out the best way to compact as much into each one keeping it small compact and portable by the time of this ration this uh, particular ration uh, which this one's a work in progress I got nothing to show you in the box except for some loose crackers and uh, boiled sweets this would have had compressed cereal bars a compressed meat block and that would have been a dehydrated meat product, really, really compressed tight, that would be that could be eaten dry or crumbled up into the tin with water to make a thin stew or soup. Uh, you'd have more of the bouillon cubes. Uh, the oatmeal block would not have uh, would have been a compressed block of oatmeal and sugars. Again, could be eaten a lot like a granola bar today or something. Could be eaten uh, as was or ground up and uh, put into hot water. Um, you'd have powdered drink mixes, more t the tea, um, more sugar, more sugar, and uh, salt, and toilet paper. Again, that, you know, reducing the weight, almost having it with a compressed dehydrated product that eventually became the standard issue 24-hour ration. These are some more reproduction rations. Um, again, the tin's probably not as accurate. They're what can be acquired and looking for the look, the feel, and everything else. A different style of emergency ration. Again, with that compact bar, sugar, tea, matches. Um, this one is more uh, like the Horlicks, though. This would be this particular style had the compressed sugar tablets, carbohydrate tablets, almost like caramels. They really are. When you look at the originals, they look like caramel candies. It's all about compressed carbohydrates. Uh, a single item tea ration, so you could have another cup of. Um, again, three in one. You sit down, make up the whole tin with your messmates, and everyone have a cup, or take out a little, make your tea, and keep going. And then you had one that didn't even try to impersonate anything else, boiled sweets, matches, and salt. So almost like your condiments. The matches became important, of course, for not just the cigarettes, the pipe, whatever. It was... Uh, meant to keep your fuel or light your fuel for your your cooker uh, the British had a solid fuel uh, cooker that came with the compo rations it was a three fold out so it's called a three leg stove it was three pieces of metal hinged together that would fold out and there was a round metal disc in the box that you were very very carefully instructed to save because that went down in those legs and that held the fuel tab and the legs would go up past that and you'd put your mess tin on that. There was also another style of cooker that was utilized and uh, readily available it's called the Tommy cooker and we know it today as sterno jellied fuel 
and you pop the lid, light it up. These are still available, although the style is slightly changed. The originals seem to have all had round holes in them. They're practically impossible to get. For some reason, the manufacturers of the jelly fuels, which are still making them today, changed this, the design a few years ago, and now they're all these slits. So this was also available and used for cooking and heating up the rations. For those uh, soldiers that were not cigarette smokers, there was the pipe and tobacco. You had your field dressing. This is a reproduction. Um, you can get from suppliers originals, but most of them are post-war, so reproductions. I just don't have the proper rubberized cloth on there, but this shows and it does the design. This was kept on your person. Uh, the small pocket on the pants was where you were supposed to put this. Uh, it could be found easily by someone finding you wounded in the field because they weren't supposed to use theirs on you. They were supposed to use yours on you. So when you see the soldiers with it on their helmet or uh, in the pocket, you were supposed to rip it off of that and use their dressing. That way, if you got wounded, you always had a dressing so you could bandage your own wounds. Either bandage your own wounds or someone else could bandage your wounds. a water sterilization kit. Um, you couldn't necessarily be assured of the purity of the water so they issued uh, these kits. Uh, it would have the instructions inside. Uh, this particular water sterilization kit had it was a two-step process. The first bottle was used to sterilize the water. The second bottle was used to neutralize the flavor from the sterilization so that it, the water would be more palatable. Um, as discussed, the wonderful Balmoral of a Scottish Argyll and Sutherland soldier. The more important helmet, Mark II, um, with its scrim net and burlap strapping for camouflage. We know it as the Tommy helmet. Um, vital. Another cigarette reproduction pack from the NAFI, which was the British version of the Post Exchange, um, the stores that soldiers could go to to buy little comfort items. Um, very, very important and vital piece of equipment, the pocket knife. The Marlin Spike was designed for undoing tight knots in the ropes. They were hemp ropes. This is on a lanyard that would go around the waist so that it could go in the pocket, be pulled out and used, but not lost. That was your big thing. That was vital. was some kind of device to keep it attached to you so you wouldn't lose your all-important pocket knife. It has a bottle opener, knife blade, screwdriver, and that Marlin Spike. You could use that for other things than uh, untying knots, but that was useful on wet ropes when undoing them. A lot of soldiers would have a second belt, and that was for what they called walking out. So you were uh, part of the uniform regulations was you were supposed to have your service belt on you, so they would get a, acquire a second one so they didn't have to unstrap all that gear that I showed you earlier so that they could just pop this on. So a second belt was a important thing. And I said these are the Mills bombs. They're fake. These are solid resin. They just can never be made to function as real grenades. Thank God, you know, they're, they're, they're great for displays. There's no need for a real one. Not in my collection, anyway. Um, this was the British style of grenade, and it's the Mark 36, and it's the longest serving um, grenade in the world, which is cool, kind of, sort of. <laughs> it's a very long serving style. The 
color bands were designed to show what type of explosive was inside. If there was another band at the top, that would indicate that it had been waterproofed, which would have been vital in the Pacific Theater. Um, and these markings up here would indicate whether or not it was a live, a practice, or some other style of, uh, of grenade use. Corporals were issued two. The average soldier was supposed to be issued one. So a corporal would get two of these. That's not a carry handle. These would be kept in the pocket uh, or ammunition pouch so that uh, they would not get snagged and accidentally uh, blow you up. A corporal was a section leader, so he might get issued a map case and compass depending on wh what was going on in the battlefield and how much autonomy his unit would have. Uh, sections would get more and more autonomy as they would move forward and get separated out. So this was the GPS of the day, a compass and a map. In the map case would be stored vital tools, pencils for marking on the maps or filling out notes, a uh, map protractor or ruler to make measurements of distances, the map, and there would be other things put in here, message forms to forward to um, through runners what information needed was found in the field that needed to be forwarded. Um, the British Army had the Army Book 153, which is a notebook. Hold on to that, refill that, so you don't waste. But the Army Book, you'd also find letters, order copies of orders. You weren't supposed to find copies of orders, because uh, you weren't supposed to carry that stuff in the field, just like you weren't supposed to actually carry personal letters, photographs, and other things that could be used for intelligence, but soldiers did. Um, you'd find black, blank notebooks necessary and important. That way you could write your notes out, instructions, or write down your orders so you would have no misunderstanding of what you were supposed to do. Um, there were a variety of standard issue flashlights to aid at night. This is a style, it's called a signal style. Um, practically every single army on the Western Front had this, uh, a, some form of this particular flashlight. It has a different colored films that you could push up to signal at night or to preserve your night vision. Um, it could be buttoned on the blouse, the, 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 the field jacket, so that you could do hands free and look down and, and investigate your maps or anything. A little push button that would actually be make it so you could signal some flashes, like oh three flashes if you're your if you acknowledge my signal or a full on switch. These were very useful, very handy. They take a uh, different style of battery. There are adapters, so you can use modern batteries in them. This particular battery style is still manufactured. It's a, if I remember correctly, it's a 9.5 volt battery. It's a large uh, battery. Um, you'd have spare bulbs in here, so that if the bulb blew, you could replace it. We have the general re the light. General Purpose Respirator Mask. As I said, this was a later war uh, mask. They uh, tried to go lighten the load uh, and removed the gas mask with the hose going down to the filter, World War I style, and came up with a lighter style. Uh, th this was actually copying a German style of mask. The Germans uh, had moved to a non-hosed mask very early on. They had uh, one even in World War I. Um, Several armies had a variety of them. The British Army moved to that style. You may find these ba these bags all over the place, and you have no clue. You never had a clue that it was a gas mask bag. Um, you carry your mask and filter. This is a, if I remember correctly, this is a Danish filter. These masks stayed in use after the war, so a lot of re uh, a lot of original masks can be found with modern cylinders. By the way, never breathe through the old cylinders. A lot of them used uh, asbestos as the filtering agent inside and they cannot 
can't be uh, stressed enough that there's no way of knowing how safe those are. So never, when you go play with your mask, never breathe through those original cylinders. Make sure it's a post-war safe one if you want to do that kind of dress up, or it has been what they, what they call demilled, which is the contents have been removed, but not by you, by someone who knows what they're doing with safety equipment because it's asbestos. You would have, there's a strap inside here for hooking around. This was also designed for hooking on the belt and worn on the side. Um, or it could be carried in what's called the ready position with the strap on the chest, just like the respirator masks uh, used at the beginning of the war. The two pockets on the side carry cleaning wool for cleaning uh, yourself and the mask from exposure. And this is a repro. Um, this would have multiple tubes of an anti-gas salve to or anti-blister agent to wipe on your skin. The color of the tin designated the year of manufacture or the type of salve in it, what type of gas um, agent it was designed to uh, neutralize. Um, they kept coming up with better and better ones through the war. Um, in the back here is a envelope that held six three clear, three uh, tinted eye shields. We've seen it. Rommel's got one on him. He preferred the English ones, uh, but the Germans made them also. They were designed for protecting the eyes. They were carried there. On the bottom here is a little pocket inside the pocket. There were a couple of different styles of these little metal things. They could either be these little dish style or a cylinder style anti-dimming. It was meant, it was a cloth treated with a chemical to clean the lenses and also help prevent them from fogging up while being worn. Very vital. Vision's hard enough in these things. It's not so fun when they fog up. There were a variety of pamphlets issued to the troops to prepare them for their various uh, theaters of operation. This one was designed and, and meant to explain to the servicemen about conditions in France after the years of occupation by the Germans. So it was designed to uh, inform them and get them prepared for the conditions that they would find. Um, this is a reproduction. They were a softbound uh, booklet. Uh, because I can't uh, do the display on this, paper is a lot more brittle. So this is great for the dis public displays where you can let people hands-on touch. Hands-on is really important for exposing people to the information and helping them really connect. This is a 1932 regulation infantry manual which covers the drill and proper steps, salutes, formations, regulations. Um, this NCOs and officers would have and it was their job to impart all of this information to the regular soldier. Pipe cleaning tool for the pipe. Spoon style can opener. It was designed to open a can and that was meant to be a sm very, very small spoon for eating if you had nothing else. Pocket watches had by this point become a, a relatively standard item that was e easily affordable for a lot of people. Very basic, very vital. Make sure you're in the right spot at the right time. You got to have a timepiece. Pocket watches actually became an outgrowth and invention of World War I, uh, the wrist watch.